In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21, God declares his intention with this earth. He says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God's intention is to fill this earth with his glory, creating a peaceful environment in the process. However, when we look around us, we find peace being broken or violated with acts of violence and destruction. We witness this with our own eyes in our own local communities with local social disorder. On a national scale or international scale, we watch it on our TVs and read it in our news feeds with civil war and uprisings and nations going to war with each other. We also see the diplomats and ambassadors of these nations and international bodies striving to create a peaceful solution to these difficult problems. Sometimes they have limited success and the peace deal is brokered. Often deals and negotiations break down. The result is more strife. This leads to more lost life, more injured persons, more broken families, more homelessness and deeper poverty and ultimately more agony and pain. Again, we have been seeing this with the so-called guards of war, truces with space for peace to be established, breaking down. So will there ever be a sol real solution to these problems that creates a lack of peace? Let's look at the Middle East again as an example, a scenario example. At present, there is civil war in Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq. In many areas in these countries, the national government has no control whatsoever. Life is controlled by warring warlords, exerting dictatorial control over civilians. Then there has been civil uprisings in Egypt and Libya, the result of which have seen dictators and leaders of these countries overthrown. In these countries, the dust is still not settled. Then there is the Jewish and Palestinian problem. Wars have and are being fought over the territory commonly known as the Holy Land. The same is also true of the city of Jerusalem, a divided city that has not known peace, let alone true peace. When we survey the peace bodies that have been set up, usually under the United Nations umbrella, we find that they also fail. Within such organisations we find corruption and manipulation of circumstances or committees to suit personal or national ambitions. All seem to be searching for the elusive peace. At the Prime Minister's press conference recently on the 4th of August, the spokesperson said concerning the Gaza war, finally she stressed the need for Palestinian and Israeli leaders to find a way forward to lasting peace. This year we are commemorating the events of World War I, a war that shattered the peace of Europe. Peace was eventually created after the deaths of thousands of humans, yet it did not last long. The rise of Hitler and the Third Reich, along with the ambitions of Japan, saw peace shattered again. This time it was on <coughs> the international scale of World War II, being fought around the whole globe. The establishment of the United Nations in Saftemak has only controlled wars. Look at the work of the UN peacekeeping troops. They need soldiers to keep the peace. Itself a very strange irony. And look at a particular example. UNIFIL, U-N-I-F-I-L, United Nations Interim Forces in Lebanon. Interim forces are there temporarily until order is established. It was created on the 19th of March, 1978, 36 years ago. And in those mandates is renewed annually, currently running out at the end of this month, it has been more of a permanent <coughs> fixture than of an interim measure. Progress to peace, let alone real peace, is painfully slow, with many backward steps. Now, as this is a religious talk, we will be looking today at how God intends to fill this earth with his glory and create true, lasting peace. 
But let us lay a foundation first. Come with me to the Bible and to the second of Timothy chapter three. The second of Timothy chapter three verse seventeen. Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So basically that's saying that all scripture is inspired of God so that we can learn from it. Now, as we've seen, peace is intrinsically broken down by humans seeking often for their own power and fame. This evil side of human nature first started back in the cursings in Genesis chapter 3. Call me back to Genesis chapter 3. And verse 14. Genesis 3 verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy bed shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten the tree which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, is sorrow shall not eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. <coughs> now this evil side of human nature <coughs> is further elaborated in Romans and is known in scripture as sin. Come with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 verse 15. <coughs> it's a little bit of a complicated little section this, but we'll read it. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not, for what I would, that do I not. What I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I can send them to the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, I do that which I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present in me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another war in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Here, the Apostle is, is explaining how sin controls his actions and thoughts. So on a larger scale, every single one of us is driven by sinful actions and thoughts. We may show it in anger or selfishness or acts against our neighbours, etc. When it's manifested nationally, nations go to war with each other, and national ideologies are reinforced upon civilian subjects. A good section of the Bible is what is known as Bible prophecy, and it's about events largely to be fulfilled. So, exactly what is Bible prophecy? Bible prophecy is when one foretells the future in our case, we're telling the events concerning nations in the Middle East in relation to Israel as recorded in the Bible. It is fairly obvious 
But if events foretold don't happen or are not seen to stand a chance of happening, then it can all be a load of nonsense. The Bible backs this up itself. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So basically, it's all prophesied so that it doesn't happen, it's loaded nonsense. Let's have a look at another reference in Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah 28 verse 9. The prophet which prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. The Bible has foretold about the rise of the modern state of Israel, a northern superpower that will invade the Middle East. In the context of true place, this is an important development. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 38. And have a look at one of these prophecies. Ezekiel 38. Now, we will not go into detail in this chapter, but the prophecy is about a Russian-European invasion of the Middle East into the countries of Israel and Egypt. Many component verses of this chapter are fulfilled with a whole awaiting fulfilment. So let's look at verse 11 of Ezekiel chapter 38. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unborn villages, I will go to them that are rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates. Here is a state of peace in the Middle East to such an extent that security is lapsed. In old-fashioned terminology, low walls and gates, etc., is like medieval cities used to have as their defences. The Middle East process has got somewhere to go, but no doubt the peace negotiators will be proud of achieving the most difficult problem of all time. But this is like peace before, as we've seen before, with the two world wars, to be shattered by what is described in verse 10 of Ezekiel 38 as an evil thought, or as the revised version puts it, devise an evil device. Peace is again shattered by evil human beings. Verse 10 of Ezekiel 38. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. However, these events described in this chapter will both bring about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. Come with me to the first of Thessalonians in chapter 5. First of Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. <clears throat> but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as prevail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Here is a warning to believers about being lapsed in the faith during a time of peace and safety. Safety goes hand in hand with peace 
For example, we can walk safely the streets in time of peace at night. In Isaiah chapter 9, Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. These are words that we sit here so often at a certain time of the year, but we may not fully appreciate or understand their full meaning. This prophecy of Jesus shows that it is he who will bring about everlasting peace on this earth. Note the words of verse 7. God's government shall have no end to peace. True everlasting peace will be a reality. There are a number of other prophecies concerning this time. Come with me back to chapter 2 of this prophecy of Isaiah and to verse 1. Isaiah 2 verse 1 The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So there's a prophecy concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Here is a prophecy concerning Jerusalem as the capital of God's international government. How the nations will learn of God's way, and most notably in verse 4, how they shall remake their weapons of warfare and mass destruction into implements of agriculture. And also, most notably, that they shall not learn about war any longer. Here is the real chance of creating real peace and a real proper basis I want to build upon. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65 verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice for ever, in that I'll, in which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard of in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die in a hundred years old, but the sin of being a hundred years old shall be cursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and live in habit. They shall not plant and live eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. 
and also back to the reading that we read earlier, chapter 11, verse 5. Chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the capron together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow shall bear, and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Note the phrase that they shall not hurt nor destroy. Hurting and destruction is associated with times of war and unrest. The phrase refers to times of peace, especially referring to Jerusalem, which means the city of peace. But this peace also extends to the animal kingdom also. Finally, there is still one more thing to do. One more action that needs to be done. Come with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Death is the result of sin as we have seen tonight. So when death is done away with, the curse which we have seen earlier in Genesis is also gone, and with it the tendency for humans to commit evil then truly God's glory will cover the whole earth. <coughs> so we believe that ultimately there will be real everlasting <coughs> peace on this earth that will never be broken nor destroyed. But it needs, as we have seen, one, the return of Jesus Christ to this earth, two, the establishment of God's laws and methods, and three, the removal of sin and the inherent evil in humans. You can have your part in this time through repentance and baptism. And may God bless you to that end.